I always go back to that poem when home is in the mouth of a shark you have no choice but to flee the time is never right to attempt migration by sea this risk is not worth taking allow me to be clear if you take to the sea you will not come to the United States. I'm just wondering when was the last time you remember seeing a Haitian boat trying to get to the United States? It was probably about a week ago. Uh, they'll have sails that are like not professionally made but are sewn together and the Haitians are usually packed onto the boat. I was um, talking to your colleague about when the uptick started, when uh, the president of Haiti was assassinated last July, and then there was a, a huge devastating earthquake in August of 2021. So people are leaving because they are afraid of their safety and security. If the lieutenant and his team identify any boats on the water, the Coast Guard will intercept them and take the desperate migrants back to where their perilous journey began. You have to go back home and think like, hey, why are we doing this, you know? Because the first time you catch them, uh, I had to take a look at myself in the mirror and say, this is really difficult. Like, these people are just trying to have a better lives. Um, but you have to remind yourself that these are not always safe vessels. And a lot of the times when we find them, it's because they're alive. A lot of times people have died, people being strained at sea, and they rescued them, and we are grateful. But at the same time, once they receive those people, they, they quickly send them back to Haiti. So I don't see the humanitarian part in that. As the humanitarian situation in Haiti worsens, more people are fleeing. In the past year, the US has sent back more than 7,000 Haitians that have traveled by sea and deported more than 25,000 who came by land. And there is a process, we're just not using it. By not giving us the claimers of asylum due process, we're breaking international law and convention. For criminal deportees, people who've served time in prison in the United States, the situation is even more dire. How can you be deported and then get straight into prison in Haiti? Uh, I'm, I'm in hell, literally. I'm in hell. This is the worst I've ever dealt with. My family, my wife cries every night. The kids. The kids are kids, but they go through it. White cries every night. The justice system, the criminal system, the Haiti government has kidnapped my husband, and they're holding him for ransom. On this episode of Fault Lines, we look at what life is like for Haitians who have been deported back to a country in chaos. I wish there was an easier process for uh, them to make it over. Haiti's second largest city, Cap Haitian, lies on the northern coast. Some of the Haitians who were deported from the US were flown here. We've arranged to meet one of them. We're on our way to meet a young man who's been hiding out in the Haitian countryside. He was deported from the US last year, but he says he can't go home because a gang has threatened to kill him. Euh, par raison de sécurité et puis rester dans l'anonymat, je préfère que, que nous relèmes Jack au lieu de non officiel. Jacques is 26 years old. He used to live in Port-au-Prince, but he's now in hiding outside of the city. He's afraid to return home because he says a local gang accused him of ratting them out to the police. Et, 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 Je me suis dit que c'était un peu parce que des fois, on est attaqué et on a arrêté des gens. Et puis, il y a une permission de dire si toutefois que n'y a pas qu'à jouer une moune par laquelle on a arrêté, c'est sur moi qui a tiré revanche. Et puis, il y a un petit revanche sur moi et la famille. Puisque je me sens ici, même côté avec la famille, par rapport à moi-même, je me servi en menace pour tout. Et puis, je viens faire que je viens mettre comme dehors. Cherchez-moi, hein, cherchez-moi, hein, checkez moi Et puis, je suis là en attendant que la calme. 
Like many Haitians who were fleeing dangerous conditions, Jacques made his way first to South America. From there, he traveled over land to the US-Mexico border, where he intended to seek asylum. <laughs> Jacques arrived in Del Rio, Texas in September 2021, along with almost 15,000 Haitians. He lost all of his documents during his treacherous journey there. The situation posed a major dilemma for the Biden administration, both logistically and politically. Conservative media and Republicans blasted the White House as weak on immigration. They waited for Joe Biden to become president and they came here for the free health care and housing that Joe Biden promised them. An Al Jazeera camera caught a Border Patrol agent cursing at a Haitian migrant. Hey, you use your women? This is why your country because you use your women for this. The images of Border Patrol on horseback went viral, drawing more attention to the crisis. We witnessed with horror the images that were emerging from Del Rio on these uh, Border Patrol officers that were chasing Haitian uh, asylum seekers in horseback. So I think what happened in Del Rio uh, was a certainly a harrowing and unconscionable, and for many, uh, maybe an epiphany for them. Uh, but for most of us, that was really just, imagine all the things that we don't see. That's what brought us back to a time of slavery in the United States, when the masters were holding black people with complete force and complete power. The White House responded with sympathy toward the plight of the Haitian migrants. What I saw depicted about um, those individuals on horseback treating human beings the way they were is horrible. And um, I fully support what is happening right now, which is a thorough investigation. Within a week, all of the migrants were cleared out of the makeshift camp. Thousands of people returned to Mexico to avoid being deported. Many were processed and moved to immigration detention facilities in the US. 2,000 were swiftly flown back to Haiti. Jacques was one of them. The atmosphere awaiting Jacques back home resembled a war zone. Gangs have been battling each other in the capital, Port-au-Prince. More than 1,000 people have been killed in the violence just this year. Residents have been forced to flee their homes. Kidnappings have become commonplace. People have been escaping Haiti from generalized violence at the hands of criminal groups, gangs, with no protection from, from uh, the authorities in Haiti. Nearly half the country, or close to five million people, are facing acute hunger. Even cholera has returned after being eradicated three years ago. Gas is $20 a gallon right now. Food, health, education, it's a state in complete collapse. The security situation in the country has deteriorated significantly in the past year. Recently, Haitians have taken to the streets protesting high gas prices and a government that they have little confidence in. Starting in September 2021, the US conducted more than 200 flights, expelling more than 25,000 Haitians. In protest, Dan Foote resigned his position as the Biden administration's special envoy for Haiti, calling the deportations inhumane and counterproductive. We're sending people back into hell, where anybody can get killed today just by standing in the wrong place. We're sending the little kids back there with them. They don't have a place to stay. 
Is that humane? Is that civilized? Is, are those American principles? What it is shocking this time is that the Biden administration has built a narrative that they were going to be different. The US government did not hear asylum claims from thousands of Haitians due to a policy first established under President Trump. Title 42 is a public health order that uses the COVID-19 pandemic as a pretext for deportations without hearing claims for asylum. The Biden administration policy towards Haitians seeking safety and asylum has been one that is violating the human rights of those people who are in need of international protection. Title 42 is a public health authority and not an immigration policy. It is not specific to Haitian nationals. People who were forcibly returned to Haiti were never, never offered COVID testing, COVID vaccine. They were not even receiving the minimum to prevent COVID spread. Do we know who has tested positive if people got sick, any kind of symptoms uh, among this group of 15,000, you said? Uh, yes, so uh, we did not, we do not uh, test, we did not test that population of individuals. Uh, we do not know, I do not know, I should say, if I may be perfectly accurate, I do not know whether anyone was sick with COVID. Title 42 is only an excuse to prevent people from seeking asylum at the border with the only intention to deter people from exercising a right. Because migration has become such a hot button issue, and I think President Biden, who was responsible for our migration policy in Central and Latin America when he was vice president, understands how intractable the problem is, that rather than go through the hard work of figure out how to solve it, it's just easier to get votes by closing the border and deporting people. The Biden administration planned to end Title 42 after most of the Haitian deportation flights, but Republicans blocked them in court. A federal judge struck down Title 42 in November, ending it. He wrote that government officials knew the order would likely expel migrants to locations with a high probability of persecution, torture, violent assaults, or rape. The history, the dreams, the families, all, everything, everything is falling down. The policy stood in sharp contrast to another situation. Ukrainian refugees who were welcomed at the U.S.-Mexico border. In April of 2022, the administration announced it would allow 100,000 Ukrainians to come to the U.S. for two years if they had a sponsor who could support them. To have received Ukrainians with just a passport and be allowed in with respect, with dignity, with compassion, humanize their, their, their pain that shall be the norm. The next month, flights to Haiti rose dramatically. In May, more than 4,000 would-be asylum seekers were deported from the US. The Associated Press reported that out of 84 nationalities requesting asylum over a recent three-year period, Haitians were dead last in their acceptance rate. You know, I hate to be a broken record, but there does seem to be a pervasive and systemic anti-Black response. There's a disparate impact on black immigrants. You have to wonder, going back to what President Trump mentioned, we want people from Norway who have blue eyes, uh, blonde hair, but we do not want people from shithole countries like Haiti and many African countries. So what I really understood is that Trump said it, Biden proved it. The United States also deports people who are legal residents but have been convicted of a crime. Some of them are in prison again, this time in Haiti, and can't get out. The police know that they have American ties. This is an absolute death sentence. Stop the deportations to Haiti! You are putting a death sentence on these people! Family members have identified 30 men who are stuck in limbo. They say that Haitian police have imprisoned them in Port-au-Prince and asked them for money to let their loved ones out. Haiti's pre-trial detention system is criminal in itself. And for many years, 
they have taken whomever they want and they throw them in the penitentiary and they just hold them. Recently they've started doing that with all the criminal deportees and it's currently going for five to ten thousand dollars to get out of the penitentiary. My name is Patrick Jr. I'm being held in a, in a state prison in Haiti for ransom by the government. It's bad for us deportees. They ask them for money that we don't have and we can't afford. Patrick Jorney is one of those criminal deportees trapped at the National Penitentiary. In 2010, he was convicted of first-degree robbery in a home invasion in the US. He served almost a decade in prison before ICE took custody of him. He fought for several years to stay, but in June of 2022, he was deported back to Haiti the country where he was born. Straight out the plan, they take us, it's like a legal kidnapping, man. When he arrived, he was thrust into prison, even though he's never been charged with a crime here. He hasn't even been in Haiti since he was four years old. Can you describe it a little bit more than hell? Imagine a room with like 40 people, 90 degrees at night. Then you're dealing with mosquitoes in the circumstances you're dealing with, with rats crawling on you. Fort Lines obtained videos from inside the prison that detail the squalid conditions. Water situation is terrible. Same water that you bathe with, that's what you actually would probably have to drink. The UN Secretary General confirmed that more than 180 people have died in Haiti's prisons this year alone from severe malnutrition. And the United States Congress for the past several years has actually set money aside to feed the prisoners because the Haitian government can't do it. So the conditions in the National Penitentiary are not fit for animals. Everything is a struggle, man. It's never a peaceful moment, but we do the best that we can as deportees to stick together. But any, any, any regular person, most people will commit suicide already. It's that bad. Patrick's lifeline to keep him alive while he's stuck in this nightmare is far from Haiti. We're gonna go do a little shopping, and we're gonna pick up someone's groceries and drop them off at their house. In southern New Jersey, Patrick's wife, Laura, has taken on work in addition to her full-time job as an emergency medical technician. She needs to send money to Haiti, so her husband has access to the bare essentials. So if Patrick needs food or water, I'm able to do a couple of jobs, and I can send him $50 without having to wait two weeks for a paycheck. I think one cart would do. They're all one size. All right. Patrick doesn't have any charges. He j is just being held. Now, we have had people ask us for money um, for his release and we tried to call lawyers in Haiti, and they would ask for five, $6,000. Sometimes he can go days without eating, five days, six days, eight days once, days without electricity. So phone calls will be very minimal, you know, and then I would start to get worried. Sometimes I think about him dying in that prison like um, how I would may never um, be able to say goodbye. So a couple of days ago, I talked to Patrick mm -hmm. and obviously he was in prison right. and we asked him, what would you like to say to your wife? And this is what he said. You have like the person that you love so much, going through so much pain. How do you deal with that yourself? It's it's hard to keep his spirits up as well as keep mine. Fight with him until the end, until the day we die. They about to take the power, man. Yeah. Be before before we lose the power, you lose the power. What do you want the world to know about your story? I don't know, man. There's people here that got 13 years in, never seen a judge. This is a lost system. 
Yeah. It's about who you know. And I don't know nobody. I don't know nobody. I, I fear of losing my wife and everything. We reached out to ICE and the Department of Homeland Security for comment on Patrick's situation, but they didn't respond. The White House declined to speak with us on camera for this story, but we were able to interview a State Department official who works on Haiti. Over the past 14 months, there's been some 25,000 Haitian migrants or asylum seekers that have tried to head to the United States and have been returned to Haiti. Why were they not given that opportunity to seek asylum in the United States? So the United States immigration system is something that is managed by the Department of Homeland Security. We at the State Department work with our DH DHS colleagues in that context. The role of the State Department together with USAID is to address, help to address the conditions on the ground so that Haitians don't see a need to migrate so that they can see a place for themselves within Haiti. So that wasn't what I asked. What I asked was 25,000 at least Haitian asylum seekers, migrants, came to the US looking for somewhere safe to live and they were returned back to Haiti. So migration and issues around repatriation are obviously extremely complex and difficult. This is something that the Biden administration has taken on board in looking at a hemispheric wide solution to migration, because the migration, of course, is not just coming from Haiti. When the Haitian asylum seekers are being deported back to Haiti and they see a difference between how they're treated and how other asylum seekers are being treated, for instance, Ukrainians. Femi, as I said, these are extremely difficult questions that involve people's lives and people's well-being. And that is something that the State Department and the broader uh, U.S. government is doing everything that we can to address. Ms. Patrick Jones speaking. I'm here. Almost five months after first entering the prison, Patrick was released. He's not entirely sure why, but he thinks that speaking out about the situation helped. I guess that's what you could call it, my humble mention. Things are bad, but you know, I'm grateful. I'm grateful, and I mean, God is good. He's found a room in Port-au-Prince, but he's afraid if he goes outside, he could get kidnapped. He remains far away from his family in New Jersey, and they're not sure what to do next. So it's just some some barriers that we have to knock down, some walls, maybe a sea or ocean, <laughs> you know? But, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm in love with them. As the situation in Haiti continues to worsen, the White House considered the possibility of sending Haitians captured at sea to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Immigrant rights groups protested the idea in a letter to President Biden, writing, Your administration should not add yet another chapter to the shameful U.S. history of mistreatment and racism toward Haitian people seeking protection. My uh, um, message for the U.S. government, stop being a part of the external and internal violence in Haiti. Deportation is violence. And that is violence on the first black republic and the second country in the Americas. We need to support asylum seekers. Um, we especially need to focus on that when you consider the role that US foreign policy has played in destabilizing regions and why they have had to uh, flee uh, unspeakable uh, violence and trauma and tragedies. If you had a chance to talk to the US government about deportations, the asylum process, what would you tell them? I would tell them that